Welcome back. Today we're going to start chapter three and we're going to look at exponential functions and their graphs. So a lot of this may be reviewed for you. So in the past, in the previous chapters, we've looked at algebraic functions and those can ex be expressed with sums, differences, multiples, quotients, powers, and roots. Now we're going to start looking at functions that are transcendental. And that means that they are not algebraic. They're going to be different ways of having functions. So the definition of an ex exponential function is that when a is greater than zero and a cannot equal one, for x, any real number of x, the function will be f of x equals a to the x. Now it's really important to think about why a cannot equal one. Because if we plugged in one for a, f of x equals one to the x, well, that's always just going to be a constant. That's not going to be an exponential function. So let's complete this table of values and identify the characteristics of the graph for the function f of x equals four to the x. So if we plug in negative one, well, that's going to be one fourth. When we plug in zero, four to the zero will be one. Now four to the one half is the square root of four, which is just two. Four to the one is four and four squared is 16. So graphing that, I'm just gonna do a quick sketch, but I'll put one right here and we can kind of see this graph will be increasing. So looking at this graph, even though it gets pretty close to the x-axis as we, x approaches negative infinity, it's never going to touch the x-axis. So we will not have any x-intercepts for this exponential function. We do have a y-intercept at 0, 1. The domain of this function is going to be all real numbers. But the range is restricted from 0 to pause infinity, not including 0. We can consider that the x-axis is an asymptote. So y equals 0 would be a horizontal asymptote. Now let's look at these characteristics. Again, the domain of the function when a is greater than 1 would be all real numbers. The range again is 0 to infinity. We do have a horizontal asymptote. So as x approaches negative infinity, that value a to the x will be approaching 0. There are no x-intercepts or zeros. The y-intercept is 0, 1. This function is continuous. It's a smooth curve. And as x approaches infinity, the function is increasing. Now let's consider some of the transformations. So the first one is 4 to the negative x, which we can consider as f of negative x. And remember, this is going to be a reflection on the y-axis. So initially the function was increasing. So now it's going to be decreasing. And the y-intercept is still going to be 0, 1. So Let's just circle some of these. So this is going to be decreasing. The domain doesn't change. It's still negative infinity to infinity, and the range is still zero to infinity. The horizontal asymptote is still y equals zero. The y-intercept is zero, one, and there's still no x-intercepts. 
Now let's look at the transformation negative 4 to the x. This will be a reflection on the x-axis. So remember, it originally went, the parent function went up. Now we're going to have it reflect on the axis. So it goes down here. And it'll be decreasing. Now the domain is still negative infinity to infinity, but the range is going to change. Since it approaches negative infinity as x approaches infinity. The horizontal asymptote is still the x-axis, but there's a reflection here, so the y-intercept will be 0, negative 1. And there's still no x-intercepts. Now let's look to the next one, which has a horizontal translation. So the x plus 1 is in the exponent but we can consider it kind of like the factor that we had for parabolas. So this is going to be a shift or translation, one unit to the left. So originally this point was zero, one, now it'll be negative one, one and go up here. So if we're going to find the y-intercept, we just have to plug in 0, and you can see really clearly that it's going to be 0, 4. So it's still increasing. The domain still negative infinity to infinity. The range doesn't change. The horizontal asymptote did not change just the y-intercept. All right, for the next one, this is going to be a vertical shift up one unit. So now, We're going to have everything shift up here. Still increasing. The domain is still negative infinity to infinity. But the range just got bumped up. So I'm going to put from 1 to infinity. Because our horizontal asymptote is now 1. The y-intercept also got moved up 1. So that's 0, 2 and there's still no x-intercepts. Now let's look at a combination of transformations. So for this function, remember we said that there is going to be reflection on the y-axis. And then for the minus 4, it's going to translate or shift down 4 units. So when we think about the domain, well, the domain's still going to be all real numbers. So negative infinity to infinity. As soon as it was reflected on the y-axis, it became a decreasing function, right? But then it's going to also move down four units. So that means that not only the function will move down, but also the horizontal asymptote. So the range here will be from negative 4 to positive infinity. And we know that the horizontal asymptote is now y equals negative 4. I'm also going to write that we know that this function is decreasing. So this y-intercept here will be 0, negative 4, and there will be an x-intercept now. So to find the x-intercept, we have to set the equation 
equal to zero. So four, x, four to the negative x equals, let me set it, minus four equals zero. So four to the negative x equals four. So we know that this was four to the one right there. So my graph is probably not a very good graph because it should have been steeper here, a little misleading. But we know that negative x has to equal one, so x must be negative one. So this point is negative one, zero. And the y-intercept was zero, negative three, not negative four. That was the y-intercept here. And then here will be the asymptote, which is the negative four. Okay, now let's look at the next one. For this one, we're going to have two things happening. So remember, we always want to work with the factor. So inside the parentheses, and we're looking at the horizontal shift first. So this is going to shift to the left. Two reflect on the y-axis. So our r is reflect. Okay, and then there is no stretch here, but there is a vertical translation. So this is going to be going down. Four units. Okay, so what does that mean? So originally, let me just draw, draw the graph here. So originally, and let's just follow this point, uh, the y, uh, the y intercept here. So originally, it was zero, one, it goes two to the left. So now it's going to be negative two, z negative two, one. And then it's going to be reflected on the y-axis. So it ends up being over here at two. They should be all on the same line here. Let me make this a little bit higher, but it would be two, one. And then it's going to be shifted down four, so it's over here. So we know that five is going to be the horizontal asymptote, y equals negative five. We know that it's going to be um, decreasing, right? So it, w well, it was flipped over here, right? It was originally increasing, it was shifted, and now it's going to be decreasing. So it's going to be like this. Okay, so there's definitely going to be a x-intercept. So let's write the information that we know. This is going to be all real numbers for the domain. The range is going to go from negative five to positive infinity. There's going to be a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative five. There's going to be, let me put the y-intercept, well, we don't have either of them, so I'll have to solve for these. So let's do this. Let's plug in zero to get the y-intercept. So f of zero would be four to the zero squared minus four, right? So that's gonna be 16 minus four, so that's 12. So our y-intercept is 0, 12. And then our x-intercept, where we're going to set the equation equal to 0. So that was 4 to the negative x plus 2 minus 4 equals 0. So I'm going to add 4 to both sides. So we get 4 to the negative x plus two equals four, 
And now since I know that they have the same base, I could set them equal to each other. So this is negative one, so x equals one. So I could make fi fix this picture a little bit because we knew that the y-intercept was zero twelve, the uh, the x-intercept was positive one zero, and I'm just going to fix this a little bit here so that it's a little bit steeper. So it goes here, and then. It probably will not be on my graph. It'll be too high. So it'll be like this. And again, that's a sketch. So I'm going to approximate that value too. All right. So just make sure you're careful when you have uh, multiple transformations. OK. For this example, we're actually going to solve exponential equations. And when we consider the function of exponential, um, they're all going to be one to one. It passes the horizontal line test. So if you through any horizontal line, there will only be one x for every y. All right, so we're going to use that knowledge to solve. When we have exponential equations, we can rewrite them with a common base. So if I say three and nine, we know they have a common base of three. So we can rewrite square root of three as three to the one half, and nine as three squared, all that raised to the x plus one. Now using the properties of logarithms, a power raised to a power will multiply those exponents and since they have the same base, we know that those exponents have to be equal. So I'm just going to distribute this. So this is 2x plus 2. Subtract 2, we get negative 3 over 2. And the last step is to divide by 2. So x would equal negative 3 over 4. So what we can do is also plug that in to check. Now for the next one, they both have a base of 2. So 1 half is really 2 to the negative 1. And then two, 8 would be 2 cubed. So negative x has to equal 3. So x would be negative 3. Before we go on, I want to make sure we give some credit to one of the best and most famous mathematicians. So we're looking at Euler's number today. And a little background about Euler is that there, he's the only mathematician that has two numbers named after him, E and the Euler Mascheroni constant gamma. So we're going to focus on Euler's number today. And I just wanted to give you a little background because a lot of the things that we've been covering in preparation for calculus have been used or introduced by Euler. So looking at sigma, the sum, looking at, well, E, we're going to look at that in a minute, of uh, anything that has f of x or i in imaginary numbers. In geometry, you may have looked at the Euler's line, which connects the orthocenter, circumcenter, and centroid. We're going to start using it in um, some more the Euler identity for trig functions. We've already looked at imaginary numbers and complex numbers. But there are so many ways that Euler has contributed to the field of mathematics, and it's interwoven in everything that we've been doing so far. So what is E? So when we consider E, it is a number I would say, make sure you guys know it's an irrational number, but it's an idea of constant compounding. It's an idea that we're going to approach a number, we're going to have a limit if we keep compounding a number by one over n, raised to the n. Another way, so the, this first way, I would say that was from uh, Naples, Napier and Bernoulli. Okay, so this whole number, the history of E, 
has spanned across many centuries. But the idea is of compounding really started with Napier and Bernoulli. Now it was really, you know, there's many mathematicians, but there's really um, Euler that made it prominent when he was writing a publication about firing cannons. So we use E in reference, in deference of Euler. And Euler explained it as the sum of one over n factorial. And so if you see this as a function, you plug in one, you plug in two, right here, you plug in three, you're going to get closer and closer to this value e, which is between two and three, and is approximately 2.7. Now e is a natural phenomenon. And when we talk about exponential growth, we're going to reference e many times. It, it's, you know, because of the beauty and simplicity, it actually applies and um, you're see, you can see it in many things, including nature. Okay, so we're going to look at the exponential function. And here we have a translation. Okay, so we just want to make sure that we're okay with looking at these functions. So again, remember the parent graph of an exponential function is increasing. It has that y-intercept of 0, 1. The, y, the x-axis is the horizontal asymptote. So for this one, we're actually going to have two steps. It's going to be a shift left, three units, and the reflection make sure I write that correctly, on the x-axis, okay, because that negative is out in front. So when we shift it over, well, that y-intercept would become, I'll move it over a little bit, negative 3, 1. But we're going to reflect it over the x-axis, so it'll go like this. And again, this is just a sketch, and it'll be a little bit steeper here. I should make it steeper, but I wanted to keep it kind of in the picture. So, there we go. All right, so looking at this graph, we know that it's going to be decreasing. That reflection made it decreasing. The domain is still negative infinity to infinity. The range is going to be negative infinity to zero. It's a horizontal asymptote, so it'll be a y equals zero. There are going to be no x-intercepts. And then we will have a y-intercept, so we just have to plug in zero. So it'll be negative e cubed, so it'll be down here. We'll need to use a calculator to find that decimal value. So zero, negative e cubed would be the y-intercept. Now we're going to use the one-to-one -one properties of E. It is the same base here. So we can set this, these two exponents equal to each other and solve. So it, whenever I solve, we want to make it equal to zero. And we can factor that pretty easily. That's going to be x minus two, x minus three. So our x will equal two and three. Now let's consider compound interest. All right, so it looks very similar to Euler's number, that idea of compounding and growing, that natural growth. So when something is being con compounded continuously, we will use base E to find that amount. Okay, let's look at four different scenarios. So we have 12,000 invested at an annual rate of 3%. And we want to find the balance after five years compounded in different ways. 
So when it's compounded annually, that's going to be n equals 1. When it's compounded quarterly, well, that's going to be n equals 4. And then compounded monthly, well, there's 12 months in a year. And then continuously, we're going to use Euler's number. So just as a review, our P is our principal. That's 12,000. Our rate in decimal form will be 0, 3. And our time will be 5 years. So setting up these equations, if we wanted to find how much will be in the count after five years, if it's compounded annually, well, that would be A equals 12,000 times 1 plus 0 0.03 divided by 1. So just that will be OK. And then times 5 times 1. So 12,000. And this is going to be 1.03 to the fifth. And so that amount would be 13,911 and 29 cents. We try to round to the nearest penny. For quarterly, the amount will be 12,000, that was our principal, times 1 plus the rate divided by n raised to the n times t. So let me make sure I write that. Okay, so we have to be a little bit careful because this is compounded quarterly. So 1.0, well, 0, 0.3 is at the point 0, 0.0075. So this is 1.0075 raised to the 20th. And that will be about 13,000. There you go, 934 and 21 cents. Now let's look at compounded monthly. Same principle, 12,000. 1 plus the rate of 0 0.03 divided by n raised to the n times t, which is 5. So I can write that in there. So 12,000. And 0 0.03 divided by 12 is 0 0.0025. And this will be raised to the 60. So that's going to be about 13,939 dollars and 40 cents. All right, for the last one, compounded continuously. Now we're going to use the natural, uh, sorry, Euler's number, which is natural growth. So we know that the A equals P times E to the RT. So this is 12,000, that was our initial amount. E raised to the 0 0.03 times five. So we're going to have to raise E to the 1.5 or sorry, 0.15, not 1.5, that would be too big, 0.15, and that'll be about 13,942 dollars and one penny. So looking at these values, they're all pretty close. Okay, so if we had a number that was out of an outlier here, we know we probably did something wrong. Okay, but the formula for compound interest is coming from the idea of Euler's number. So you can see applications not just in nature, but in money. I hope this lesson was helpful, and I'll see you all in class.